You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. Coming up on today's programme, rising energy costs fuel a rise in inflation and the cost of living crisis. A major oil spill in Peru, which authorities say was caused by the Tonga volcano eruption. President Biden sets out new plans to tackle wildfires in the US as he marks one year in office. And a warning that future leaders need more help to deal with the consequences of climate change. We look at what to expect in the 2040s and 2050s. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and challenge those coming up with the solutions. A cost of living crisis is expected to take grip on the UK in the coming weeks with inflation now at 5.4%. That's the highest rate since March 1992. One of the main factors of this rising cost of living is oil and gas prices feeding into our energy bills. And the government is now scrambling to prevent an estimated annual household increase of hundreds of pounds. But the government is also committed to net zero targets set out last year as part of COP26. So how much is tackling one crisis going to impact the other? And could green targets in fact help the costs come down for families? Well, joining me now is our climate change correspondent, Hannah Thomas-Peter. So Hannah, what does the cost of living crisis mean for green targets? Well, everybody's thinking hard about cash or lack of it. And that has meant that a potentially calamitous fault line is emerging within the Conservative Party, as if Boris Johnson didn't have enough to worry about. You'll remember that the net zero target to reduce carbon emissions to net zero by 2050 is enshrined in law. It was an important part of the Conservative Party's uh, manifesto. But now there is a big row brewing over it. The Office for Budget Responsibility uh, thinks the total investment needed to get to net zero carbon emissions by 2050 could run up to nearly one and a half trillion pounds. Uh, that will, of course, they say, reduce uh, or produce huge savings, well over a trillion pounds, you know, as a result. But an awful lot of that spending, they say, is going to have to happen in the next decade if the UK is going to hit its targets, which means that this issue is now being weaponized. Uh, we've got, on the one hand, a group of some 20 MPs called the Net Zero Security uh, or Scrutiny Group, the Net Zero Scrutiny Group, led by people like Steve Baker MP, a serial rebel and Brexiteer, who's now set his sights on this issue. And he is saying that it could be bigger than Brexit in terms of its ability to divide the, co the country. He's even invoked in an interview with Sky News the poll tax riots. He has said that the government needs to dig for more oil and gas in the North Sea to increase its domestic uh, supply and to scrap green levies on energy bills to ease the pain uh, for ordinary people. And he has told me that uh, he's been in charge of rebellions over Brexit and over COVID. But this one in relation to the net zero targets, he says, is the fastest growing and has got an awful lot of traction. And then on the other side, you've got a much larger group of green Conservative MPs, the Conservative Environment Network, very much aligned with the Prime Minister. Now, some of them are dis dismissing the net zero scrutiny group, saying that is an organisation of people who are kind of going perilously close to climate, being climate deniers. They're populists just looking to score political points. But there are those who say Steve Baker is a very good organiser. We should worry about this, this argument that is going to land with ordinary people. And they are trying to make their own argument aligned with Boris Johnson, that the Green Revolution represents a huge opportunity. It is actually the answer, they say, to rising energy costs in particular, because investing in renewables will eventually bring those prices down and give the UK a degree of energy sovereignty uh, that, it, that it needs. Now, the eruption of the underwater volcano in the South Pacific nation of Tonga sent a huge ash cloud into the skies above and prompted a tsunami which has wiped out entire villages. 
But the impacts don't stop there. More than 10,000 kilometres away in Peru, the waves from the volcano have caused an environmental disaster, with an estimated 6,000 barrels of oil spilled into the water, which is rich in marine life. We need to declare a state of emergency throughout this whole sector so the armed forces can come in and help with their personnel and equipment. As a human being, I can tell you it's truly been a tremendous heartbreak to watch the birds and sea lions dying. Well, Crystal Shesky is the Marine Governance Initiative of the Peruvian Society for Environmental Law and joins us from close to where the oil spill happened, north of Lima in Peru. Uh, so welcome to you. Tell us more about this spill then. Just how bad is it and how is it affecting where you are? Um, it's been absolutely devastating. I've never seen environmental disaster from this close um, uh, with this kind of scale. We have at least 1,000 fishers here in the place where, where I am right now in Ancon who have lost their livelihoods at the moment and will probably be affected for many years to come because uh, the marine environment is completely polluted. Um, we need to stop the spread of that of this oil slick right now. And when you start cleaning up um, the beaches and the and the waters that have been contaminated, on top of that, there need to be some really deep investigations into what happened because the whole world knew that the Tonga um, about the Tonga eruption, but why didn't the Peruvian authorities issue a tsunami warning like other countries did? And why did Repsol continue with the transfer of oil from its refinery to a large oil tanker, despite knowing that um, these these waves were going to arrive um, at our coast. So there are many open questions and um, pe the, the re people responsible uh, need to be held to justice. And what we need to do is um, ensure that the people who are most affected, who are the most vulnerable, the fishers and the people who live off tour of, of sea tourism here um, are compensated um, okay. um, adequately. OK, well, Christel Sheske, we appreciate your time. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Now, volcanoes can have devastating impacts on the environment around them, but what are the long-term impacts on climate change? Oh. It was kind of like bombs were just going off around the place, so we knew that something catastrophic had happened. Now for some of the day's other climate news. And the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz says he wants Germany's presidency of the G7 to be the nucleus of an international climate club. He spoke at the World Economic Forum today alongside US climate envoy John Kerry, who called for leaders to be more ambitious on climate targets. Climate change will limit where the Winter Olympics can be held in the future, a new study has found. Researchers at the University of Waterloo in Canada say unless greenhouse gas emissions are drastically reduced, only one of the previous 21 hosts, Sapporo in Japan, could reliably stage the Games again by the end of the century. The Biden administration has unveiled a 10-year plan to combat the country's worsening seasonal wildfires. President Joe Biden is marking his first year in office, but has faced criticism for failing to get members of his own party to commit to the spending bill that would have funded his climate pledges.
And we'll be talking more about whether Joe Biden's climate policies have gone far enough when I'm joined by the chief executive of the climate group, Helen Clarkson, and The Guardian columnist, George Monbiot, shortly. Now then, let's take a look at our data dashboard now, where we can show you the power mix in the UK right now. And you can see that coal is making up 0.3% and gas 43.5%. And you can see also how much is coming from renewable energy like wind and power. That's 35.1% there. And let me also show you this number here. Now, this is the CO2 emissions being released into the atmosphere globally. And as you can see, that number there ticking up all the time. And it's those CO2 emissions that are, of course, fueling climate change. And a new study by the Institute for Public Policy Research is warning that millennial leaders, likely to be the decision makers in the future, need help preparing for the consequences of biodiversity loss in the 2040s and 2050s. So with an average of 1.2 degrees of warming, the world is already experiencing more heat waves and record temperatures were set last summer in Canada and in Sicily. Now, by around 2050, the IPCC predicts that extreme heat events will become more than five times more likely. So heat waves that historically happened once a decade are likely to happen every other year. Now, extreme heat leads directly to increased wildfires, and those in Australia in 2019 and 20 were attributed to climate change. And those events will be four times more likely to occur if we reach two degrees of warming by 2050, according to the World Weather Attribution Group. Now, huge floods have already become more frequent. A study found that devastating flooding in Germany in July last year was made up to nine times more likely because of climate change. And that's because the atmosphere is holding more water as the world heats up. And if it continues to warm, we could see more intense floods, nearly twice as frequently. So the question for future leaders is how to plan for and adapt to the world's rising temperatures and what defences can be put in place to protect us. So now we know what future generations need to prepare for, but how are we preparing for climate change in the next few decades? Well, joining us after the break to discuss that will be the Chief Executive of the Climate Group, Helen Clarkson, and George Monbiot, environmentalist and Guardian columnist. Hello and welcome back to The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. Now, we're getting straight to discussing the climate issues of the day now with Chief Executive of the Climate Group, Helen Clarkson, and The Guardian columnist, George Monbiot. So a very good evening to both of you. Good to see you both. Evening. So, President Biden has been in office for a year and he arrived on a wave of optimism on climate action. One of his first acts was to rejoin the pa Paris Climate Accord after Donald Trump left it. And he soon announced ambitious policy measures to cut emissions and rebuild the economy with climate central to every policy. But his progress has been stymied by politics. According to one analyst, he overpromised and underdelivered. So let's find out what our guests make of his record so far. Helen, he did come into office a year ago with climate change one of his main four priorities. So what's your take on it? Has he delivered? Yeah, I, you know, at the outset, I think um, it was very good. He very quickly uh, came back into the Paris Agreement. He gave that certainty that businesses and states in the US were looking for and others who played such a critical role over the four years where we had President Trump, who was obviously very antithetical to the agenda. That was all good. And we ran an event uh, alongside Biden, had a, a leadership summit last April. We ran something called US Climate Action Week alongside that. And I was really impressed with members of his administration coming out, really understanding, uh, you know, the brief. They really got it. You could see that they really internalized this and were very, very serious about it. So that's all good. And then we saw John Kerry go out across the year and do a lot of diplomacy. So I think there's a lot to praise there. I think that the issue is, you mentioned it, not having that domestic legislation. There's some in the infrastructure bill that's mostly about adaptation but in terms of the NDC that they've set and the US hitting that most of that is sitting in the build back better uh, legislation which hasn't gone through it's delayed and I think that's problematic because we know that this presidency is time limited we don't know what's coming next a lot of that needs to get in place now and as far as that diplomacy goes without that legislation you can see the kind of eyebrows of other world leaders going up so I think those are the bits that, that really are holding them back. 
Well, yes, yeah, so, so obviously some problems, George, but what do you, do you make of his record? Because, as, as was being pointed out there by Helen, a, a White House Office of Domestic Climate Policy, a John Kerry being appointed to go and out and reassert US leadership on the global stage, a handful of new regulations promising major investments in clean energy and, and resetting US targets. I mean, do you welcome what he's set out so far? Well, the crucial thing with climate is not so much the new things you do as the old things you stop doing. Um, so, for instance, leaving fossil fuels in the ground is absolutely crucial. And what have we seen? Unfortunately, quite the opposite. We've seen um, a massive new leases for oil drilling issued by the Biden administration, some of them immediately after the climate talks in, in Glasgow. They, they basically, basically went home and signed to, off. They legally bound to follow through on those, don't they? Uh, so, I, I beg your pardon? Doesn't the White House say they were legally compelled to follow through on some of That's those? That's what they say. And, yeah, they lost a lawsuit. That's what they say. But actually, they had a whole series of possible mechanisms they could have used to fight that and to push back against it, and they failed to do that. Um, but worse than that, we now see a succession of administration officials going to the oil industry and saying, drill, baby, drill. We want more domestic output of oil and gas, so will you please deliver that for us? And, you know, that might sort of keep drivers happy when they're paying for fuel at the pump, but that is absolutely contrary to everything that Biden says he's doing on the climate. And that's the stuff that counts. You can come up with all sorts of wonderful policies. You can re-sign the Paris Agreement, which is great. You know, and he's done some positive things like cancelling the Keystone XL pipeline. But unless you are actually prepared to leave fossil fuels in the ground, you undermine all that good work. That's okay. the important thing. Helen, do you agree with that? And to what extent do you think that actually it's, it's his political opponents that are, that are blocking him? It's not him. He wants to push through his Build Back Better climate plans, but um, he's being blocked. Yeah, I mean, of course, look, I agree. I, I think that's a really critical point about, you know, I think we see this around the world. There's always like, well, we'll just have one last coal mine. We'll just do that one and then we'll get on with it. And so the seriousness comes, as George says, about like, when do you, what do you stop doing? How quickly do you stop doing that? I think, it, of course, it's true about his political opponents and we just got to keep the pressure on the administration to um, to do what they're saying that they're going to do and also to make sure that the, the way is forward for places like California. We do a lot of work with California and I think it's been really important that, you know, the, the federal government is getting out of the way of California so that it can pass vehicle standards, which will make a difference there. But yes, of course, that, that point about leaving, uh, leaving fuel in the ground and I'm really worried about, you know, globally, not just the US, yeah. but what's happening on gas and the fact that we're all sort of somehow buying into this okay. um, story around gas. And, and sorry really to damaged. cut in, just, we haven't got much time, but I do want to get that kind of international feel as well, George, because if the US doesn't meet its targets, how much does that send out the wrong message to, to other countries they're putting pressure on uh, to meet their own? It's catastrophic, really, because still people look to the US for leadership, rightly or wrongly, wrongly on climate, I think, because its record has been pretty appalling. But if even Biden can't deliver, then other countries will say, well, what's the point of us doing it? What's the point of us doing it if the US isn't doing it? And already we see worldwide an almost perfect circle of finger pointing. Everyone uh, are saying it's, it's, it's their responsibility. They're going to do it. They're to blame. And it goes right the way around the world and comes back to where you started. And it doesn't solve this massive catastrophe. OK, so a lot of pressure for, for, on him to deliver on his promises, I guess. OK, let's move on to our second topic, shall we? Because earlier we painted a picture of what the world might look like not too long from now if global warming continues along a trajectory that looks all too likely. And a report warns today of the huge challenge that will pose for future leaders. Uh, so, Helen, the next generation of leaders potentially face a very different world, don't they? So how should current leaders prepare for that? Yeah, I, I read the report and I don't disagree with a word in it. Of course, the world's going to look very different. My worry, again, is and it's almost like that finger pointing piece is I don't want current leaders distracted by sort of sitting down and pondering how they get their future generations ready. We need to think about what we're doing right, right now. And I think what current leaders need to be thinking about is massive changes to the way that they operate. How do we really 
embrace the urgency, the scale of change that we need. And I think they should be thinking more along the lines of how do we get those voices into boardrooms now than, you know, do we do we just push this off onto the next generation and say that it's about preparing them? So I don't disagree with that report, but I, I just worry that, again, it's about pushing the problem onto someone else. Well, yes, and George, isn't that the nature of short-term political cycles, that inevitably politicians will be thinking about the here and now and what voters think about spending money? Well, it shouldn't be like that. And, and in fact, I think programmes like yours are very important in trying to refocus them and say, look, you know, you will be judged. Your long-term legacy is going to be this, because this is the most important issue on earth. This is the biggest challenge humanity has ever faced. If you get this wrong, everything else you do is dust. It's completely irrelevant because there won't be any legacy um, at all if we don't um, tackle this huge, overwhelming, existential crisis. And, you know, I don't think all politicians are completely venal and completely short-sighted and completely stupid about issues like this. I think it's about the pressure they feel. And at the moment, they're feeling pressure from people saying, oh, our fuel bills are too high and stuff. They need to be feeling more of the kind of pressure which we on this programme are trying to put on them. They need to be feeling more people saying, sorry, you know, we will judge you on this. This is the important thing. And then I think, you know, as some politicians have done in the past, um, we will see people being more statesmanlike, taking that long-term view, putting aside their immediate short-term interests for something more important. Okay. And very briefly, Helen, public opinion, if you look at polls, is shifting in favour of action on climate change. Do you think that is what will make the difference? That will put pressure on businesses, it'll put pressure on politicians and, and change will happen? Are you optimistic? That is one source of optimism is, and I think this largely goes to the school strikes and, and others who've raised that voice and actually just pushing pressure on their parents at home. What are you doing about this? And sort of taking that, uh, you know, what George was just saying there and domestic, you know, bringing it domestically. What are you doing about this? And we really see that with working with business and government. It's moving from that remote thing of people out there want this to actually feeling that um, that strong pressure coming. And I think we see the poll shifting public opinion really has changed and moved. You see that even in how the media is covering things. So there, there's a grain of optimism there, but we've got to get that sense of this is about changes that we do right, right now that are going to make that difference over the long term horizon. OK, I'm going to leave on the, the word optimism, even if there's only a grain of optimism. We'll, we'll leave it there. Helen Clarkson, and George Monbiot, thanks both very much indeed. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, tomorrow I'm going to be joined by a member on the climate change, uh, the Committee on Climate Change, Dame Julia King, and leading expert in carbon footprinting and a director at the Small World Consulting, Mike Berners-Lee. But for today, that's all from us. Thanks for joining us.